And one of the Rangers was like, oh, is that a famous cat? And I was like, yeah, it's P22. It's the one who lives in the Hollywood sign. We got, we got celebrity cats. We got celebrity trees. We got everything. Hello and welcome to Here in L.A., Los Feliz edition. Today, we chat with Casey Schneider, who is a hiker, an author, and a bit of a historian. Casey wrote the fantastic book, Discovering Griffith Park, A Local's Guide. We talk about ghosts, curses, how freaking big the park is, and how complicated its namesake, Griffith J. Griffith, was. So grab your walking stick and join us as we chat with Casey Snyder. Well, Casey, thanks so much for, for uh, being here today. Um, thank you for making a book that is readable to a person with ADD. Um, uh, it, they're short, you're funny. Uh, super informative. Um, it, I really love the book a lot. So, oh, that's thanks. great. Th- thank you so much. Yeah, I um, that that was that was by design. Um, I <laughs> I pitched it to my publisher as a user's manual for Griffith Park, um, and I really wanted it to be um, you know, for hikers, for equestrians, for picnickers, for tourists, for locals, a little something for everybody. So, I'm glad you you found it useful. Are you a, a native uh, Californian? I'm not. I'm from uh, I'm from New England. I'm from Connecticut originally, uh, and small town in Connecticut. Literally grew up across the street from a farm built in the 1700s, uh, and uh, went to school in Boston. Moved to LA. In I did an internship in, in LA in 2002, um, and then moved out in 2003. And I've been living. I lived in LA for almost 18 years. Um, so, and now I'm kind of splitting time between LA and Portland. So, uh, I was, I, I, I consider myself an Angelino. Well, good. I mean, when, when you write a book yes. like this, yeah. I mean, I, I hope so. That, I mean, no one, no one um, wrote a book that enters you into the club pretty did. well. So, yeah, this is, uh, I mean, there, there's a really great history book of Griffith Park really um, called the Centennial History by Mike Eberts. Um, but no one's done like a guidebook for the park, uh, until I did last year. So. Yeah, well, that's again. That's one of the reasons I wrote it because that's like the market's wide open. How weird, how weird is that? Uh, 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 spoiler alert: You do not make a lot of money writing guidebooks. Uh, that's for right, the outdoors. Uh, so it, it it really has to be something you're passionate about or something you really care about. I'm very passionate about it. I've I've lived in um, Little Armenia for over 20 years, and um, one thing that I loved about your book was you taught me a lot. So one of the things that I learned from you, I, I learned so much. So th- again, thank you. Um, I I had not realized that Griffith Park is five times as large as Central Park and four times as large as the Golden Gate Park. And I guess that's because when you're on a mountainous area, it, it just, I guess you don't count, you don't count it as much. <laughs> Yeah, it's, um, you know, that, that's a statistic that's pretty shocking for a lot of people, even native Angelinos. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do, I think that there's a couple of reasons for that. One is um, if, you, if you meet people who love Griffith Park and use Griffith Park, they tend to use it the way that they want to use it, and that's it. So you'll get people who are hikers who, you know, don't really go to the zoo or they don't go to the golf courses, or you get horseback riders but really don't go into the interior of the park. So a lot of people are shocked at what is Griffith Park. Um, you know, people think Griffith Park is just the observatory, maybe, and they don't think it's the Autry, or they don't think it's Travel Town. Like, there's just so much there. And also, um, you know, with Central Park and with Golden Gate Park, which are both amazing parks, obviously, um, they're, they're big rectangles. So they're on a city grid, and if you are in a building that overlooks it, or if you're looking at an aerial photograph, you get it. Like you get it right away. You can pretty much see the whole park right down the straight line. Whereas Griffith Park has these kind of sprawling tendrils in different directions. It's literally got a mountain range running through it. So it's really hard to see the park all at once. You really have to be like in a helicopter to see the whole park at once. Even even from the middle of the park on some of those high peaks in the central part of the park, um, you really, because it's canyons and ravines, you really can't see it all in one fell swoop. So I think people are really shocked by how big it is. One of the things that I, that I really liked about how your book began is um, you, you acknowledge that a lot of times people, when they think about Griffith Park, just think about the namesake, but it's been around for a really long time. And 
one of the names that popped out to me is Jose Vicente Feliz, yes. um, uh, which Los Feliz is named after, which is what this podcast episode is about. Um, and I think it's interesting how he got the land. Um, he was just a soldier, right? Yeah, it's, you know, one of, so uh, if you don't know me, if you, if you haven't read any of my stuff before, you should know that I'm a pretty big history nerd. Um, so for me, um, digging into the story of Griffith Park um, and finding that anytime I found something that was really interesting and you pull the thread a little bit, you just see how, how connected it is to everything else. And really with Griffith Park, you can tell the story of California, the story of Los Angeles, all inside Griffith Park. So Griffith Park, um, before it was a park, before it was anything, before the Spanish were here, was Tongva land. Um, there's a, a, a monument or a plaque to the Tongva people uh, in the Ferndale area of Griffith Park. Um, new research is showing that there's probably three kind of settlements or meeting grounds that were in or near Griffith Park. Um, but then when you get to, you know, the Western kind of European uh, history in terms of Griffith Park, um, the first Europeans to go through Griffith Park were um, in, it was Jose Vicente Feliz as part of the De Anza expedition which was an overland route um, going from basically what is today Mexico up to Monterey, which was then the capital of Alta, California. Um, so those were the first Europeans to set foot inside Griffith Park. Um, one of those soldiers was a guy named Jose Vicente Feliz. Um, he was just, you know, he was a guy carrying a musket, trying to keep people safe on this overland route. Um, and then he came back uh, several years later as part of the Pobladores, which were the original founders of the Pueblo of Los Angeles. So these were a bunch of um, folks from Mexican heritage, indigenous heritage. Um, I believe there were some, um, some uh, uh, Af African heritage in there as well. Um, and these were folks that came and founded the city. And he kind of was the sort of, it wasn't like a mayor, but it was kind of a, kind of a half mayor of the Pueblo of LA. So for his service, um, he was granted what was then known as Rancho Los Feliz, which encompassed all of Griffith Park, as well as lots of Little Armenia, Los Feliz, um, Edendale, Silver Lake, um, a pretty big chunk of land for his service. And he, you know, he lived in LA, his family had that land for generations. Um, it was, and, and then, you know, from there, you can trace it to like, you know, when the Americans invaded and took it over, um, General Baldwin set up what was then the first golf course in LA on this seized land in Rancho Los Feliz, um, which is in Griffith Park. So then it, you know, fell into the hands of Griffith J. Griffith, and then it became a park. And like, you really can tell the whole story of LA through this park. So uh, Jose Vicente Feliz was kind of the first European uh, landholder and his family's land, um, you know, there's still the, um, the film office in the park, which is right next to the visitor center is it's not his house. It's one of his descendants, but it still has the original Adobe walls. Um, it's, it's the, um, it's the Los Feliz Adobe and it's a national historic marker. Or there's a whole bunch of plaques on it. The inside is just a film office. It's a standard office building. There's nothing really exciting about it, but the exterior of the walls are still pretty cool. And, and we can assume that one reason that um, Feliz and this expedition made their way to Griffith Park, basically, is because of the river, right? Um, yeah. it, it's easier to travel, if, especially if you're going to be heading north, to just kind of like hug that river, right? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, it's uh, Angelinos today, we're, we're getting better about this, but we... Uh, often forget that we have a river. <laughs> we often forget <laughs> that there uh, that there is actually a pretty complex and interesting watershed system all around here. Um, the LA River, where it is today, is not where it's always been. It's a river that um, you know, if if you've ever driven over it uh, on on Los Feliz Boulevard, um, going into Atwater Village in the winter, you know it gets pretty crazy in the winter. Um, and that's that's always been the case. But that was a source of drinking water. That was a source of drinking water for the Pueblo of LA for the Tonga villages that were here, um, was a source of game and provided lots of habitat. Um, LA, you know, when the, when the uh, Los Feliz and the De Anza expedition came through, looked really different than, than LA today. Uh, but the river was a pretty major resource for the folks who were living here, um, pretty much until we decided to put it in concrete in the, in the 1930s. You're absolutely right. That river doesn't look like any river in the United States, pretty much. But also, just um, that the old school version of the river um, is is uh, an ongoing theme in your book because you talk about river rights mm -hmm. and you also talk about something that I hadn't thought about, which is the cemetery being um, being there. 
I love that you incorporated the cemetery because you taught me some things about um, both of those cemeteries, including the weird, uh, is it a California law or LA law that if six people are buried, it's a cemetery. Yeah, th this was one of the craziest stories that I came across uh, doing research for the book. So uh, we're talking about the Forest Lawn Mount Sinai Cemetery which is a lot of people think is part of Griffith Park, but it's right next to it. It's actually not part of the park. Um, and it wasn't part of Rancho Los Feliz either. It was part of Rancho Providencia, which was a separate um, rancho as part of the, the whole rancho system. Um, but it could have been part of the park. The city actually put a bid on it, I think in the 40s, um, in the third, I think it was in the 1940s. Um, it, was, it was up for sale. You know, it was basically kind of a rural mountainous area. There were stories of a lot of the old Western cowboys um, who would camp out there in Rancho Providencia, uh, cross the LA River on horseback, go to like Warner Brothers, ABC Studios, shoot a bunch of Westerns, head over to where the equestrian center is now, um, get drunk at one of the saloons, get into some fights, and then cross the river and sleep it off. So that's what it was through the 1940s still, which is, which is kind of crazy to even think about. That's not that long ago um, for LA that it was like Western movie actors were like camping outside. <laughs> um, but uh, in the 1940s, the Rancho Providencia landowners put it up for sale. The city bid on it, but they were outbid by the Forest Lawn Cemetery Corporation. Um, and there was a huge public outcry um, because at that point, we were still kind of using some of the LA River water as drinking water. And people were really concerned about, oh, do you know, if we bury people, were there, and will there embalming fluids leak into the river? Does that mean that's what we're drinking? What's the pollution? Um, it was kind of a big to do, um, but there's a story that Mike Ebert shares um, in his book, A Centennial History, which is if you're into history of Griffith Park, um, that is, you absolutely must get it. It's out of print, which is kind of a pain, but the LA library system has a bunch of copies on hand. Um, if you can, you can grab one and just read through it. The stories are amazing. He's a great storyteller. Um, and one of his stories is uh, that basically like under the cover of night, uh, the set this uh, Forest Lawn Cemetery Corporation took six bodies from a county hospital and just buried them there. And there was some, uh, I think it was a California state law that said if any plot of land has six bodies buried in it, it is permanently a cemetery. So at that point, that ended the conversation. It became a cemetery, and now it's always a cemetery. So they, so the city couldn't do anything after that. book that's not that thick for you to have almost every page something that is fascinating <laughs> especially to somebody who I mean I've been around the block I've heard enough stories about LA but you've got a bunch in here so um in 1882 Griffith ended up buying uh over 4,000 acres of of Rancho Los Feliz and I always assumed that the reason he was able to buy such a big swath was Perhaps back then it was hard to farm on. Therefore, maybe the value wasn't all that much compared to other areas of LA. Would you agree with that? Right. So there's so the so the Rancho Los Feliz did include all of Griffith Park, which is not easy terrain for farming. Um, but by the time that Griffith was there, um, farming was it was still a part of LA, but the big money maker was real estate. Um, so uh, Griffith made his money. He was a he was a, a journalist for a long time. Then he kind of discovered that he could make more money basically doing like booster articles for mining and like oil and mineral interests in the West. So that's kind of how he made his fortune. Um, and when he bought uh, when he bought Rancho Los Feliz, he came to LA and he you know for all of his faults and foibles, which I'm happy to get into at any point. Um, he was a visionary for the city of LA. At this time, LA was a huge backwater in California. We were not even like the fourth or fifth biggest city. Like Santa Barbara was a bigger city than LA was at this time. And Santa Monica was like the port. Like San Pedro wasn't even around. So LA was a total backwater, but he envisioned it as a major city on the West Coast, um, and which was part of the reason why he donated land for a park later. But you know, part of that was, well, people have to live here. Um, so at this time, LA was a huge booster. Uh, there was a huge booster community in LA. The railroads were built in LA. Um, people were basically giving railroad tickets for free to folks from the Midwest. 
to come out. They'd be like, screw winter, come to LA, it's great here. We got oranges and everything. Um, it was like this magical paradise. So that was the real moneymaker. Um, and when you look at the parts of Rancho Los Feliz that aren't Griffith Park, um, that's good real estate. You know, that's that's Silver Lake, that's Echo Park, that's um, Los Feliz. Those are still pretty, pretty Tony neighborhoods for a lot of Angelinos. Um, so that was the reason that he was selling stuff. But I think, uh, you know, I don't know why he held on to uh, to Griffith Park and even or that area of Griffith Park. And even after he donated the park to the city, he kept a, a private reservation of land inside the park for his family's use. So I think he might have actually just really enjoyed being up there. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm totally fascinated by this guy because, like you say, he's a, a very complex character. And um, I heard that. I, and, and again, I love your book because it kind of um, debunked a lot of the things that I had had thought. Um, one of them was I thought that he made his money in a copper mine in Mexico. And that's how he raised enough money to um, to do this. Have you heard that before? So he was he was working with a lot of mines all around the West. Um, I don't know if there was one tied to Mexico. There was another um, another uh, pre Griffith uh, Anglo landowner who uh, had lost a ton of money in a mine in Mexico, and that was part of the supposed curse. Of Los Feliz, um, uh, that was like tragedy be befell every owner of the land after the Los Felices were, were, were kicked off of it uh, through potentially shady real estate dealings. Um, I think that was the one that was in was in Mexico. Um, but he, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Griffith got Griffith got his money through writing and boosterism and, and real estate for the most part. As as writers, isn't that great to hear? Uh, yeah, it's not really <laughs> realistic for us anymore. <laughs> Uh, I, I cannot afford any real estate in the city of LA. <laughs> so, so one of one of the, the the undisputable facts is that he did try to shoot his wife in Santa Monica. Actually, he did. Yeah. He successfully shot his wife in Santa yes. Monica. Yeah. And um, and I think blew out one of her eyeballs. And I heard that she was like a beloved daughter of Santa Monica. And he was this flashy kind of jerk. And they could not wait to get rid of him. And he ended up spending two years in San Quentin. Yeah. But to me, that seems for attempted murder, for shooting your wife in the face. Um, was that an unusually short uh, sentence that he got? Yeah. So uh, L.A. loves a good celebrity trial. Uh, we have always loved celebrity trials. You go back to like uh, Vasquez and his like dashing um, you know, uh, outlaw status and people would come from all over the state to say, to see him and like have him sign note cards in his jail cells. Um, we love a good celebrity trial in LA. That's never going to change. Um, and Griffith was one of those celebrity trials. Um, so the, the, the sort of condensed version of the story is, um, that Griffith, uh, was a public teetotaler. Um, he was, you know, for prohibition, but in private, he drank quite a bit of whiskey every day. Uh, in some cases, several quarts of whiskey every day. Um, and uh, when he was vacationing with his wife, Tina Mesmer, um, he married, like he was doing well for himself. He was kind of a, a, a new money, flashy guy. Um, he, he both had a lot of um, supporters in LA and also a lot of detractors. And I think the detractors were mainly because he was a pretty flashy guy, um, but he was born literally dirt poor. Um, he grew up on a dirt floor house with, you know, dozens of uh, half brothers and sisters. He was orphaned in Wales at a young age. He was in, in some cases, you know, that sort of classic American myth of like the self-made man, um, you know, came over uh, to the Philadelphia area, lived with people who kind of adopted him, uh, the Maori family near Philadelphia. Um, he worked his way up. He sent money back to the Maoris uh, to thank them. He bought them a gravestone when they passed away that was really opulent. Um, he paid for all of his half brothers and sisters um, to come to America to get educations. Like he was not like a jerk, uh, you know, like a total evil guy. There, there's a, a, anytime you read something of Griffith, that's like, he was an upstanding golden citizen, or he was an evil monster who hated everyone. Like any, either one of those are wrong. He's, he's in the middle. Um, so uh, the, the sort of nasty part about him was in South Wales, he was a Protestant. There was a lot of anti-Catholic sentiment. And he brought that over with him to America and really hated Catholics, like a lot. So he was convinced that his wife was spying on him and trying to poison him on behalf of the Pope. 
And that's what he accused her of doing after he got rip roaring drunk in Santa Monica. Um, he took out a revolver, uh, made his wife get down on her knees and uh, uh, admit to these crimes. She wouldn't because she didn't do it. Um, and he cocked his pistol, aimed it at her and said, I will remind you I'm a dead shot as he pointed it right in her face. So she glanced away at the very last minute. He shot her. Um, it didn't kill her, but she stumbled out of the window, fell two stories into the suite of the hotel owners, and they rescued her and saved her life. Um, I don't know what she looked like afterward, but there was a big, a big to-do in the trial where she went and testified. Um, and there's uh, accounts in the LA Times and other newspapers about her wearing this veil when she went to the courtroom and her like removing the veil and like people were fainting in the audience. Um, so I think it was a, I think it was a pretty dramatic thing um, to see, but yeah, he did. Um, his defense was alcoholic insanity. Um, he had some really high profile lawyers working for him. Um, I forget if it was either a future or former governor of California, like really, really big names were working for him. Um, and he was found guilty uh, and spent two years in San Quentin um, which again sounds like a pretty light sentence for you know shooting your wife in the face. Uh, <laughs> I think we can all agree. Maybe he deserved a little bit more time. But then when you look at you know his time in San Quentin, he was offered um, clerical work, um, and he he turned it down. He said, "Please treat me like you would any other prisoner." And he did hard labor um, for two years in San Quentin. And then when he got out, he wrote a series of books about prison reform. Um, he basically said, "Hey, these prisons we have like." we really, we're just kind of punishing people and we're not really rehabilitating them. And if we want to have a better society, we should focus on rehabilitating. Um, and that's when he wrote a really great book called Parks, Boulevards, and Playgrounds, which was kind of his park philosophy um, that kind of gave a little, a lot actually more insight into why he don't even land um, to the city of LA for a park, which is really interesting to read. Well, and, and, and also one of the, um, the, 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 the good things about him was how how important it was that the park was free and that there was transportation to it yes. because I guess unlike these other urban parks in San Francisco and New York this was a little harder to get to and and not only did he demand that there be public transportation there but according to your book when the city refused he and his son made their own yes and drove yeah. people to this free park how yeah. cool is that this was, um, you know, li like you, when I started writing this book, I had heard only those two big, like, very end of the spectrum versions of Griffith J. Griffith. And I didn't really know a lot of the stuff that he had done. Um, so, yeah, when he donated the land to the city of L.A. for use as a park, um, Griffith Park was outside of L.A. city boundaries. So at that point, L.A. overnight had a, a park that was, you know, five times the size of Manhattan Central Park. And it wasn't even in the city. It was like you had to leave the city to get to it. Um, and he had, there was a railway line that went there initially, like before it was a park. It actually follows the old grade of Sunset Boulevard through where the, the, um, the Hafo Safo neighborhood used to be, the Happy mm -hmm. Foot Sadfoot. Um, mm -hmm. So that cut in that hill was a railroad. Um, and that kind of brought people out to that area of the city, um, partially because there was an ostrich farm. Uh, near where the old LA Zoo was, um, and also just to show you, hey, maybe you can buy some land while you're out here and like put 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 a couple put a, put a couple pennies in old Griffith J. Griffith's pockets. Um, so that was kind of the reason that he had that out there. But he looked at these parks in other cities. Um, in that book, uh, Parks, Boulevards, and Playgrounds, you know, he toured Europe, he toured the East Coast of the United States, and he looked at these these big and medium sized cities. So like Paris, London, New York, yes but also like Boston, also Hartford, um, you know, these kind of smaller cities that had big parks. And he, again, was looking at LA, which again was like a dump of a town that no one cared about. And he saw it as a future metropolis. And he said, if this is going to be a major, a major city, it needs a major world-class park. Um, so that's why he gave the land to the city as a park and had all these sort of um, conditions attached to it. Um, and one of them was, you know, you can't charge admission to the park because then it becomes a playground for the rich. And he didn't want that to happen. This was, um, you know, he saw parks not as a luxury, but as a necessity. He described them as safety valves for cities. And at this time, you know, people were kind of living, this was the age of tenements. This was the age of like, you know, OSHA wasn't around. Like you could build really crummy housing for people. Um, and the, the, the thought at the time was that 
living in an inner city with dirt and grime and noise and pollution uh, was unhealthy, both for your physical uh, being, but also your mental being. And that sort of the, that sort of cramped environment caused crime, caused vice, caused drinking, and that parks were a way to get people who lived in these places out into the natural environment where they can get some fresh air, breathe easy, get some exercise, and like reset themselves. Um, I still find that true today, um, which is really interesting. But he, you know, he did this, you know, 125 years ago. Um, he was kind of ahead of the curve on this, but that's why he had this park. That's why it was free, and that's why he tried to get transportation out there. And actually, there's there's some cool kind of urban artifacts with the transportation. If you're going up um, Vermont, uh, going up towards the Greek Theater, and you know, there's like a really wide boulevard with that wide green median. Um, that was intended to be a red car track. Um, he was lobbying Henry Huntington and trying to get him to build a red car line up to, um, you know, where the Greek observer or where the Greek would be, where the bird sanctuary was, and where the Griffith Observatory would be. That didn't turn out. Um, and then also, there's that weird little triangle uh, of land that's I think on Vermont and Hollywood, um, right before Hollywood kind of turns south. Um, there's like a, a Starbucks over there and a bank. Um, and that actually uh, was land that Griffith owned. And that's where he set up one of his bus stops to get into the park. Um, so that was like through his real estate dealings or whatever that became city land um, and this weird sort of like plaza park. But that was part of the infrastructure to help get people into Griffith Park. I asked uh, my Twitter followers and my Facebook followers some questions. I said, I'm talking to you. And um, the first thing they want to talk about is ghosts. Oh, yeah, of course. Is that a of course? I guess I just don't care much about ghosts, but people care, right? Yeah, that is, um, you know, I, I worked really closely with the Autry Museum on this book. They were really wonderful. Um, throughout the whole writing process, shared a lot of research, let me come in and see their galleries and talk to folks. Um, and one, one, of the, um, uh, one of the sort of folks behind, uh, her name was Dr. Carolyn Brucken, um, she always ex expressed exasperation that the very first question anyone wants to know is about ghost stories and curses uh, in Griffith Park. And I, you know what, I, I, I understand, like, I, I'm not a believer in ghosts, I don't believe in paranormal stuff, but it's fun. Uh, it's, it gets people interested. And, you know, in a lot of ways, you can also learn about what was going on at that time in that culture by what its ghost stories are. You look at the story of um, the curse of Griffith Park or the curse of Los Feliz. Um, and that story, while it is pretty easily debunked, uh, again, Mike Eberts and John Robinson, um, two historian authors who are wonderful, and I really recommend you looking at their work, um, they kind of looked into this and found that, you know, a lot of the folks who were in that story had some access to grind with the people who were cast as the villains in that story. Um, but it, it does tell the story of what was going on at the time. That was when, you know, the, the land that was held by these ranchos for generations by, um, by the Spanish and then the Mexicans. And uh, for a long, long time, when the Americans took over, they really took advantage of a lot of shoddy paperwork. Um, and they, they did steal a lot of land from these families. Um, you know, again, they stole it from the indigenous folks who were here beforehand, um, but it got stolen again. Um, and that was a real thing that was going on. And that's kind of what the story of the curse of the Los Felices is. It's a story about a family that has had that land for generations getting, you know, hornswoggled by a slick Yankee lawyer um, and the curse that followed. And that's that's what was going on at the time. Yeah. Well, one of the one of the ghosts uh, is uh, Peg Entwistle, and um, who I guess young people might know from a Lana Del Rey video. Um, yes. But when I look at her um, pictures online, what a beautiful woman she was. She kind of reminds me of a of a younger Kirsten Dunst. Um, yeah, yeah, I see that. You know, and. And I guess she she jumped off the H in the Hollywood land, I guess, was the sign Hollywood mm -hmm. land sign, um, when she was just 24 years old because she was heartbroken that she wasn't going to make it in Hollywood. Is that the story? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, again, uh, some things really don't change. Uh, Hollywood is a tough it's a tough industry. 
Um, it's a tough place to be. Peg was an actress who I believe um, was a stage actress from New York who moved out here. Um, and, you know, she was in a bunch of movies. She, she shot a bunch of stuff, but nothing really took off for her. And um, she was down in the dumps, probably suffered from depression. And um, she took her own life by jumping off the H on the Hollywood sign. And that's, that's a ghost story that, you know, again, whether or not it's true, people claim to, you know, see her walking around the Hollywood sign or smell the perfume that she used to wear when they're up there. Um, but that's, that's a story of the time. That's a story of early Hollywood and people coming out here to make it. Um, even modern Hollywood, people coming out here to make it and not working out. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's a, as it's, a, it's a very dramatic end. It's a, it's a really good, juicy story. Um, it's a sad story, but um, that's, that, that's a thing that happens. That, that's a way to take a ghost story and make it a little bit more meaningful in terms of like actual history and anthropology and what's going on. Uh, the, the other ghost story that people want to talk about is Picnic Table 29, mm. which is something that I'd heard about only a year ago. Um, and then, um, and, and I'm glad that you link to the LA Times story because yes. it kind of shows you of what the LA Times used to look like um, 15 years ago. The, totally. the, you know, it's uh, kind of old school. Um, but I, I guess I believed it <laughs> when yeah. I first read it. Um, it seems believable. It's about uh, lovers on a picnic table. Yes, so Haunted Picnic Table 29 is actually one of my favorite stories in Griffith Park because it's so weird um, and it's really modern. It's recent. Uh, this happened in the internet age. Um, you know, Griffith Park has this long history of people kind of like making stuff up in the park. And then over time, you know, it's there's that line in, I forget what movie it is, but like it's, it, uh, this is the West when, it, when the fact becomes legend, print the legend uh, or something to that effect. I've, it's yeah, yeah. one of those famous Westerns. Um, and yeah. this is an example of that. This was a guy, um, I think it was like 2006, maybe 2007. It was early internet. Um, and this guy made a spoof LA Times website, which is still up, um, that supposedly told the story of uh, a maintenance person in Griffith Park. Um, there was a windstorm and a tree fell over at Picnic Table 29, which is on Mount Hollywood Drive, north of the, north of the crest, so on the north side of the park. Um, and he you know, supposedly heard these voices and got chilled wind and heard these voices telling him to get out and not move the tree um, because supposedly these, these lovers had been crushed by a tree during the windstorm and died on the table. Um, so this maintenance person, you know, went back, told the supervisor, you know, basically, I'm not doing that. Like, you want someone to cut that tree, you got to get someone else. Um, so someone else went up, he heard the same voices, he cut the tree anyway, and he supposedly, like, had a heart attack and died. So, like, that was the story. Now, if you look at the website, it looks like, or it looked like the LA Times looked in 2006, 2007, um, still has some like fake ads for like Pet Boys or something in, in, the, in the margins. Uh, but if you look at the URL, it's L-A-L-A-T-I-R-N-E-S. So if you're looking at it briefly, it looks like LA Times, but it's just this spoof website. Um, and that's all I knew about that story until I wrote the book. Um, when I was giving an early presentation for the book, um, one of the guys, or actually the guy who made that website got in touch with a journalist, um, Steve Scozillo, um, who wrote an article about the book um, and said, hey, I'm the guy who made that website. Here's the story behind it. Um, and it's actually the, the names of the couple that are involved in that, uh, in that ghost story are portmanteaus or versions of the names of his longtime uh, I, I forget if it was a wife. Uh, I think it was his wife, his ex-wife and his ex-best friend. Um, so there's another really good story behind that. Um, but that's a story that didn't, I, I didn't know the answer to that story until I wrote this book. Um, so there's, there's, there's still ghost stories. There's still tales that are being told. Um, but again, you know, every, every freaking Halloween, people want to look for Haunted Picking Table number 29. Um, and, you know, you can tell them it's a made-up story. You can point them to the guy who wrote wrote me this email about it uh, and says, I made this story up, but they'll still take these, you know, uh, night vision cameras up to that area. And, oh, I heard a ghost. Oh, I hear the ghosts. They're here. They're telling me to get it. Like, it's, it's crazy. I love it. Let's, let's talk about um, people going up there in the, in the nighttime. Um, Cause I interviewed a, a, an animal cop um, a couple months ago and I asked him what the most dangerous animals were in Griffith park at night. And he said, 
they are humans. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you kind of uh, agreed with this a little bit in your book. You say the animals are are just as scared of you as you are of them, but yes. still keep your distance. Um, but first of all, you're not supposed to be in the park at night, right? Yeah, you're, you know, you're, you're really not supposed to. And the hours, I believe, I think 10 p.m. is when the park closes. There are some areas that close at sunset, so that changes throughout the year. Um, but people do, night, like the Sierra Club does night hikes. I think every, every week they go from the old LA Zoo up to Mount Hollywood or somewhere else. Um, there, I mean, and the, the thing with Griffith Park is it's not a place that's totally fenced off. So it can never really be totally closed. Um, there are access gates that are closed. Um, I almost got stuck uh, parked behind one of them once uh, when a hike took longer than we were expecting it to. Um, but, you know, thankfully we saw the ranger. He let us get out before he shut the gate. But uh, yeah, you're, I, there's a lot of parts of the park that you're not really supposed to be around uh, at nighttime. But in terms of animals, like, I mean, there are things that can hurt you there. Um, P-22 is a mountain lion who lives inside Griffith Park. We've got coyotes. Um, there's rattlesnakes up there. Um, but the reality is it's an urban park. Like you're far more likely to get hurt either driving to the park uh, than by anything that's wild, that, that's a wild animal inside the park that's going to hurt you or like you're going to get clipped trying to park somewhere. There, uh, as you know, La La Land filmed a little bit in Griffith Park, and um, one of the most iconic uh, images is of um, uh, uh, Emma Stone and uh, Ryan Gosling dancing um, on kind of a, a berm a little bit that overlooks like the Hollywood sign and in that valley of Hollywood land. And um, people have called it Kathy's Corner. But yeah. Kathy's Corner does not exist in your book, which your book is, like I say, really, really good, really, really in-depth. You taught me to um, um, not worry about ticks for 24 <laughs> hours. You taught me to um, use a, a walking stick so that the snakes know that I'm coming. Like, you get into monkey bush, monkey flowers. Yeah, monkey um, flowers, yeah. I mean, you really get into it. And when I didn't see Kathy's Corner in there, I was like... Clearly, he could not have missed this, but <laughs> but is it just a Hollywood thing? Is that what it is? What what's Kathy's Corner to you? Yeah, so Kathy's Corner um, is you know it, in many ways it may be an oversight on my part because it is a thing people look for, um, but at the end of the day, it's it's not much. Um, it's a shooting location for one movie that <laughs> happened to be around and won some some awards. Um, I, I I thought La La Land was fine. Like I don't think it was crazy good um right. it was beautiful to look at a very beautiful movie um especially that opening number on the on the 110 uh For which sure. is what, I, what i think about every time i'm taking the flyaway bus home from la <laughs> me uh, too but uh kathy's corner it's it's just abandoned mount hollywood road like there's there's nothing like distinctive about it you can get those views from lots of other parts in the park including lots of other roads on the park um so to me it wasn't really a thing that was like like a landmark necessarily. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, Griffith Park has this long history of people just making up names for things and then them sticking. So <laughs> like there, there's a lot of examples of that. Like all the citizen gardens in Griffith Park, that's Amir's garden, that's Dante's view, that's um, Captain's Roost. Uh, those were all just sort of like made up things that people started doing. Um, Amir asked for permission. So he's the only one who asked for permission to do it. Um, there's stuff like the Joe Class water stop that was a made up thing. Um, you know, the, the cardiac trail uh, on the east part of the park uh, near the old LA Zoo, near the Bill Eckert Trail, that's a made up thing. Um, if you look at maps of the park, um, even from like five, 10 years ago, there are names of trails that are totally weird that don't exist anymore. There are trails that don't exist anymore. Um, I heard from one old timer in the park that one of the old maps uh, had a trail called the DWP Trail. Um, which was not the Department of or Water and Power. Uh, it was just the three initials of two ranger or the three rangers who happened to be there when a cartographer asked them about it. So like, 
<laughs> Griffith Park has this, I think that Kathy's Corner is one of those, like I'll call them cultural graffiti. Um, not, not putting a disparaging term on them. That's like, that's a positive and a negative. Um, but I think that's, that's a thing that like, I, I don't know who Kathy is. I don't know. I, I couldn't find out who Kathy was or is or why it's named Kathy's Corner. So I, that's the thing where like, I could put it on a map, but like, I don't know the story yet. So if someone knows that story, um, please email me uh, and tell me because I would love to hear it. Uh, it's hello at modernhiker.com. Um, I'd be really happy to hear that or any story that you have about Griffith Park, to be honest. That, that sounds great. No problem. Um, you mentioned Amir's garden, and, and I don't think that this garden has been written about very much at all. And so I, I was lucky enough that my neighbor took me there um, mm -hmm. last year, and I couldn't believe how beautiful it was. And for me, it was a little steep. So I was, I was grateful that Amir put in those benches. Yes. Um, but then it was over. Once I, once I rested and, and hiked up a little bit, it was, it was kind of over. So, so it was kind of small for what it was, but it was also just so beautiful with all of these succulents. And I, I guess I just assumed that those were always there, but you taught me that, no, Amir brought them there. Yeah, so none of, the, none of those gardens were, were natural. Um, they were all planted by people. Um, various caretakers, volunteers, interesting folks. All of them have really interesting folks who are behind them. Um, Amir, uh, as I mentioned earlier, was the only person who asked for permission um, to build a garden. So it was after a fire. Um, that whole landscape was really charred. There was nothing really going on there. Um, Amir was a wine merchant. Um, I don't know where, I think someone told me he worked at Greenblatt's, um, which I think is gone now, rest in peace. I used to get really good deli sandwiches there. Um, or he worked somewhere around there during the day, full time as a wine merchant. And then in his, you know, afterward, he would go to Griffith Park and hike up this steep slope with no trails on it and start planting. Um, and he hauled water up there. He hauled soil up there. He built his own benches. He built his own picnic tables. He did the, it was a one man show. Um, and this was all because he was really impressed by the spirit of volunteerism in America. He was an Iranian immigrant who moved over here. Um, loved walking, loved parks, loved being in nature. Um, and he was there basically till he passed away. Um, the caretaker who took afterward, uh, her name was Chris Sabo. Um, she kind of uh, spent time with uh, Amir. She was very kind and gracious enough to tell me a lot of the stories. He planted a lot of memorial trees for people in the garden and there's no map for them. Um, there, there's no key, but she was pointing out like, oh, here's the tree that he planted for Huell Hauser after he visited. Here's the tree for this city council person who was really kind to Amir. Like, um, and there's no labels for them. So that all that stuff is going to get lost to history, unfortunately. Um, Chris uh, retired from her position. It was a volunteer position a couple of years ago. So now the city and the park, are, the uh, Rec and Parks is just taking care of it. And I do hope, um, you know, that Friends of Griffith Park has done a good job of uh, taking over um, for Captain's Roost and for Amir's, or sorry, um, for Dante's view. And I hope that they also um, take a look at Amir's. Um, Amir's is the one that's in best shape because it had its own dedicated caretaker for the longest time. Um, but uh, Dante's used to have dedicated caretakers. Um, Dante Orlegini, who is what it's named for. Charlie Turner um, was a caretaker. That was who that trailhead is named for. And then um, now the late, great Tom Labonge uh, was also a caretaker of Dante's view for a very, very long time. Um, so there's, there's, you know, again, you know, as I mentioned, you pull, you pull a thread on one thing in Griffith Park, and I will talk about it for 45 minutes. So uh, there's just so many stories there. One other really sweet thing about Griffith Park, and there, there, there are a lot, but you, you, you raise a, a really good point in your book, is Shane's inspiration. Mm. And this is something from this century. Um, you know, we, 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 we think a lot about how old this park is, but here's an improvement to the park that is relatively new, and it inspired 60 other playgrounds like this. This is a, a playground for... Um, kids with disabilities, right? Yes, it is. And I, I don't know exactly what the terminology is, but I think it's like the world's first all-inclusive play area for kids in that there's something for every kid 
to do there, regardless of what their physical or mental abilities are. Um, and it was done in memory of um, a, a child named Shane, who unfortunately, I think, passed away either right after he was born or maybe, you know, uh, as he was being born. Um, really sad story, but his parents uh, kept his memory alive and sort of form this foundation, which now, um, you know, what they've learned from what they've done inside Griffith Park, now they share with other people all over the world who want to build these inclusive, accessible playgrounds for kids, um, which is really, really wonderful and lovely. And what a great way to honor Shane's memory um, for that. Yeah. And, and, and also, like, you know, we know that L.A. inspires the rest of the world, but I just I just thought it was a fascinating number that you brought up that 60 other parks were inspired in such a small period of time by this and i guess it's because when you're able-bodied you don't really think about it you don't think right. that a, a, a child with um you know who, who's on crutches for example wouldn't be able to use the the jungle gyms and stuff that we grew up with right exactly so um you know so it's super sweet yeah that, that, that is um that's that's a thing that's uh you know parks kind of all around the country are over the past couple of years and hopefully continuing in the future are doing this really interesting thing where we're all kind of looking at parks and figuring out, oh, you know, the people that went to these parks when they were founded, um, generally well-to-do white people um, with 2.5 kids and a dog um, are not the same people that use the parks today. Um, they're not the same, you know, socioeconomic background, not the same, uh, physical background, not the same cultural backgrounds, and parks are really doing a great job of making themselves a little something for everyone. Um, and look, LA has issues with parks. Um, we really don't do a good job with parks in LA. It's a it's a sad state of affairs. Um, I think the Trust for Public Land does a study every year on major cities, and I think there's about forty percent of Angelinos don't live within even a 10 minute walk of like a neighborhood park or a playground. Really, LA has really big park equity problems. And if you look at other parks that predated Griffith Park, um, things like MacArthur Park, things like Elysian Park, um, we really <laughs> did not do them well. Um, we, we, we bulldoze Wilshire Boulevard through MacArthur Park. Um, Central Park, AKA Pershing Square is like, it's like this weird 1980s mall parking lot now. Um, thankfully it's gonna get redone soon. Um, and then Elysian Park had, you know, there was like six lane roads going through that park with no crosswalks. And then Dodger Stadium got dumped on top of it. Um, we, we don't do a good job with parks uh, kind of in general, but Griffith Park is the exception to the rule. Um, and it is truly a world-class park. And it is one of, the, one of the things that really filled my heart with joy, just gave me so much civic pride in LA was walking around that park any day I was there doing field work, any day I was doing research, whether it was a weekend, weekday, morning, evening, afternoon, whatever, there were so many people in that park doing all kinds of things, whether it's a quinceanera party or um, a trail race or a drum circle or, you know, soccer practice or tennis. Like there's just so much in that park for people to use. And it, it, it always left me feeling really proud about that park and about L.A. Walt Disney. Yeah. In in your book, you say that Griffith Park inspired Disneyland. Yes. Uh, so Walt Disney was inspired by Disneyland. Um, there's a lot of kind of like apocryphal. Apocry ugh, let me take that again. There's a lot of <laughs> apocryphal stories about Walt Disney um, in the park, but there is one that's true, and that is that he used to take his kids to the merry-go-round. Um, and uh, this is commemorated both at the merry-go-round and in Disneyland itself. Um, there are two park benches with plaques on them um, that say, you know, Walt, basically Walt sat here, um, and uh, he watched how much fun his kids were having on this merry-go-round uh, and thought, you know, maybe I should do an amusement park too. I should use it to do something with all my characters that kids love and give them a place to go. Um, and initially, he wanted to build this basically right next to Griffith Park. Um, where the Disney lot is now, where the ABC Studios is, um, that was his initial proposed plan for Disneyland. Um, in Burbank. In Burbank, right, right across the LA River from Griffith Park. 
Um, so uh, fortunately, um, it was determined that that was too small of a plot of land um, and that the neighbors probably wouldn't like it as much. So he went down to Anaheim instead, um, had a little bit more elbow room and could throw his money around because uh, Anaheim was not much of a not much of a town uh, until Disney came in. Um, so uh, we don't have Disneyland next to Griffith Park, but we have a lot of Disney connections inside Griffith Park. And actually, if you go to the LA Live Steamers, um, which is on the north side of the park between Travel Town and the zoo, um, it's a great place to go just in general. Um, but Walt Disney's barn is there. So Walt Disney was a scale train enthusiast, not model trains, scale trains. So this is trains that are bigger than model trains that you can actually ride on. He had this elaborate train track uh, set up at his house in the Holmby Hills, which is kind of out near Beverly Hills area. Um, uh, it's an elaborate train track with tunnels and bridges and all sorts of cool stuff. Um, and this barn that was kind of a replica of a barn that he didn't grow up in, but was from a town he grew up in, in Missouri. Um, it was for, um, they built it for a movie, and I forget the name of the movie, uh, what the name of the movie was, but he kept the barn and brought that to his home. And basically that was his like tinkering shop. And he and the early Imagineers would meet up every weekend. Um, Walt would, every morning he would shave and have a cup of coffee and his shave basin is still there in, in, in this barn. Um, and then the Imagineers would pitch ideas for rides for Disneyland or new characters for movies and all sorts of cool stuff that Disney did. Um, so when he passed away, his wife and family donated the barn and his train tracks and all of his train stuff to LA Live Steamer. So once a month, it's called the Disney Carrollwood Barn. It's open once a month. Um, and it is, even if you're like even mildly interested in Disney stuff, it is such a cool place to go. Um, there's so much Disney paraphernalia, so much history. Um, if you are a Disney nerd, like you will have a field day in there. Um, and before pandemic, um, when it was uh, a little more of a thing, like not full buses, but like tour vans would come in with, you know, people with Disney ears and stuff, and they would like go nuts in there. So it, it is well worth going to. I think, I think it's open again now. Um, but if you're going to go, definitely go early and, and beat the Disney crowds. Let's get into Griffith Observatory because there's some facts in your book that I had not known before. One of them being that it's the most visited public observatory in the world. Yeah. Uh, when it was built, it was only the third planetarium in the whole United States, which seems weird to me because we're often uh, criticized in California as, as being so young and there's no history here and all right. that. Um, and but, but the number that stuck out to to me the most was you said on opening day 17,700 people <laughs> showed up for, for the first thing I thought was where did they park but <laughs> but I guess this was before all of that so how did they even get there because there wasn't public trans like it just seemed inconceivably to me that that many people could be on top of that hill yeah that I you know I I don't know <laughs> <laughs> how they got up there. Um, if, if you look at photos from when it opened, and even for many decades after it opened, um, that whole big parking area up near where the observatory is was very different. Um, the, mm. the lawn was different. People could kind of drive pretty close to the actual observatory. Um, and of course, there were fewer people, so fewer cars. I have to imagine they had some buses bringing some folks up from that. Um, but, but yeah, you're right. It was that opening day. Like that's a big deal for at that point, LA was, um, we were a growing city, but we were very much an upstart city at that time. I don't know when we eclipsed San Francisco as the biggest city, uh, in California, but it, I, it was probably around that time. Um, cause it was built in 38, I believe, uh, don't quote me on that, but somewhere around then. Um, yeah. so, so I imagine it was, it was a big to do for LA to have a, have a big party for the observatory. And yeah, you're right. It's the third planetarium in the United States. So New York and Chicago were first. Um, and then it was LA, which was, you know, you would have guessed maybe a city like Boston uh, would have been in that mix. Boston has a pretty big science community, lots of money, very established at that time. Uh, but no, it was, it was LA, which is pretty cool. And the, the big, you know, the big thing is that, is that statistic is 
more people have looked through the stars uh, through telescopes at Griffith Observatory than anywhere else on the planet, um, which is A, amazing. Uh, B, it's a great statistic to have. LA should be very proud of that. Um, and C, that was what Griffith wanted when he gave the money for this observatory. He, so if anyone is a hiker, um, you may have been up to Mount Wilson, uh, the observatory there, or the, um, the ruins of the observatory on Echo Mountain in Altadena. Um, so the observatory on Mount Wilson was a really big, exciting thing that happened in LA when it was built. Um, this was like a world famous, super high tech, groundbreaking science was being done here. Um, and Griffith actually traveled to the Mount Wilson Observatory and got to look through a telescope and he was dumbfounded by it. Um, he, I think there's a quote about him saying, if all humanity could look through uh, the, the telescope at these stars, we would basically solve a lot of problems and end world hunger, peace and war and all that stuff. Um, and similarly, just west of that. Um, what, 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 do you, what do you think he meant by that? That, that we, would, we would see ourselves in context that we're just little peons in the universe and we should be cooler to each other. Like, yeah, you, you know, I, I think there's, there's a lot of research now about um, like mindfulness and um, even just like spending time in nature um, kind of alters your perception of self and time. Um, there's a lot of studies now that say spending time in nature or even just looking at pictures of nature, um, slow your sense of time so that you become more generous with your time. Uh, they increase your feelings of connectedness with other people. I think it's just a way of, you know, I, I, I tell this story often. I am not a person who grew up hiking. I'm not a person who grew up outdoorsy. Um, I was an indoor kid. You couldn't pay me to go outside when I was growing up. <laughs> and my first couple of years in LA, um, and, and this is, uh, this is a, a, a thing that I've heard from many people in LA. Um, I can't tell you how many times I drove past the San Gabriel Mountains or drove past the Santa Monica Mountains and never really looked at them. Um, these are huge, really beautiful mountain ranges that are so accessible to so many Angelinos and they're just background because you're looking at your speedometer, you're checking your email, you're, oh my God, I got I to I gotta get to work. I got to plan my vacation. I got to go home and visit the kids. I got to go to Ralph's and pick up groceries. Like you get so wrapped up in the minutia of things. And I think that's what Griffith meant when he was looking through this observatory on Mount Wilson was like, oh, none of this stuff really matters. Like what matters is we're all on this one tiny planet in this big black universe. It's, it's that pale blue dot image. It's the, it's the Carl Sagan quote. It's the same thing. Um, we, when humans are given that experience of awe, um, that is when we have these really nice, um, true human moments. It's just so hard to hang on to that feeling because then you go home and your phone goes crazy and you have all these 50 notifications from TikTok and all that nonsense. So it's, it's, it's hard to maintain that, but that's what he was hoping that people could see and be inspired by. Um, Thaddeus Lowe, who did the Echo Mountain House, had, that was the same reason he built his observatory up there. There was a little bit of science done there, but it was mostly uh, to kind of help people get inspired to see these things. Um, but again, that was pretty far outside of LA. To get to the Mount Wilson Observatory or to get to the Echo Mountain Observatory from LA was a big day trip. Um, Griffith Observatory um, is in the middle of the city. That's easy. You can do that and go home in a day. It's not a big deal. Um, so for Griffith to aim for that and to accomplish that is really, really tremendous. And that's, I think, one of the, well, one of the best things about Griffith Park is that, that story, that his, his, uh, his goal of getting people to care about science, to care about the planet, to learn about where they are in the universe and mission accomplished as far as that was concerned. What a great way to end this. Casey, you've been fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I learned a lot from your book. I'm going to highly recommend it to people. It's short, it's sweet. Um, it's filled with um, uh, a lot of hiking trails that I am that indoor person that you're talking about. <laughs> and But every time that, and it's usually a beautiful woman who lures me out, out into these uh, trails, I'm so happy when I'm out there and it gives, it gives me literally a different perspective of LA and, yeah. and we're in such a unique place where you can go up Runyon and in 20 minutes, you don't even feel like you're in, in a big city anymore. And the same with Griffith park and it's all right here. And thank God, Mr. Griffith, um, I'm sorry, Colonel 
uh, Griffith. Well, he wasn't actually a colonel, so it's, it's okay. You can call him <laughs> Mr. Griffith. No, I, I, I meant that ironically uh, <laughs> or sarcastically. Um, thank God that as, as, as weird of a person that he was, as conflicted of a person, as good and a bad of a person he was, at the heart of it, he wanted to share his wealth with people. Absolutely. And I just don't see that a lot these days with all these other billionaires. I don't think that Griffith would, as much as he likes space, I don't think he would have built a spaceship because that's such a, almost a selfish kind of a, a venture with yeah. science. Um, yeah, you know, what's, what's really interesting is LA kind of is and always has been a very private-minded city. Um, we don't have a lot of public space in LA. Um, compared to places like San Francisco, compared to places like New York, who have these big public parks all over the city, um, LA has always valued private space. Like the, the big selling point for LA was, hey, you live in this podunk town in Iowa. Why don't you come to LA? We can have your own private backyard. You can grow some oranges back there if you want to. It's warm all year round. You never have to deal with snow. Isn't that great? Um, and that was the mission of LA. And again, mission accomplished. We have you know, a lot of these very single family hou housing units, um, which are now causing this housing crisis throughout the West Coast. But like that, that was what LA was for. So we didn't invest in parks. And I, there is no doubt in my mind that if Griffith did not donate this land with all those stipulations saying you have to use this land as a park, um, and also if you don't, I'm taking it back. <laughs> Uh, that this would not be a park. Like this would be, um, you know, the kind of Hollywood Hills 2.0. Um, it would all be developed real estate and there would be no place for Angelinos to go and really have that like, you know, elbow bumping melting pot experience. We really don't have a lot of places like that in LA and Griffith Park is the biggest one and the best one for it. Well, it's why uh, Oprah told Adele to sing. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> over there the other day right exactly and it was beautiful yeah that's stunning, that great? stunning photography yeah <laughs> but yeah that's uh it, it's interesting like the talking about the getting outside and hiking um it's a, 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 a thing i like to point out about la that is another kind of mind-blowing thing is so the geographic center of the city of la is in franklin canyon so if you look at a map of la it's weird we have this like tail that goes down to San Pedro. We've got like spines going out in all these directions. So the geographic center of the city of LA is in Franklin Canyon, which is a unit run by the National Park Service in the world's largest urban national recreation area, the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area. So literally the heart of LA is a national recreation area in a mountain range that bisects the city. That is crazy. I'm looking at it at a map right now, and it is crazy. Um, wow, yeah, yeah, and and it's it's in it's on a range that is is still nature. Yeah, and, and when we talk about sprawl and and the negative parts about urban uh, modern urban life, um, I think you're right. In fact, when they when they built um, the Getty Museum, and when they were talking about building it, I was like, well, there's a reason that nobody's ever built there before. And I thought that it was a pure reason. I thought it was like, oh, we want to, pre no, they just couldn't figure it out yet. Yeah. And, and it, it took like a super rich family to, to figure out how to do it. Yeah. And then they ended up building all around it. And I think you're absolutely right. If Griffith had not had his stipulations, of course, uh, movie stars and and rock stars would be living on top of that mountain the way that Howard Hughes wanted to. Absolutely. And, and those are the mountains that run right into Griffith Park. So when you are in Griffith Park, you are hiking in the Santa Monica Mountains. Right on. Casey, thank you so much for your time. Uh, really appreciate this. And hopefully we can get this podcast up in a week to 10 days. Perfect. It is my pleasure to be here. Uh, you cannot shut me up about Griffith Park. So anytime <laughs> you have a question or just want to share a story, please feel free to bug me again. I'm happy to chat about it. Right on. Thanks a lot, my man. Thank you, Tony. Okay. How great was Casey? You know who else we'd hunt for ghosts of? Probably fake lovers who were crushed doing the nasty on a park bench? Our Patreons, who make it down this far in the park. When you stoke us, you're saying, Tony, Jordan, here's a pat on the back. 
here's some cash for a new mic. <laughs> here's 3,000 acres we'd, we've indirectly stolen from the natives. Every donation you hand over helps us keep this insane project to rolling. So shout out to our Patreons, Nancy Rommelman, Sean Atlow, Matt Mills, Sean Wallace, Greg and Molly, Jamie Taylor, Mark Johnson, Kira Ann, Barney Grinke, Ben Welch, Henry Furman, Jen Adams, The Lonely Chair, Trevor Wilson, and Bree Wild. Want to hear your name at the end of next week's show? Go to patreon.com slash here in LA and give. Also, shout out to our Angelinos. To be an Angelino, all you have to do is pay pals 25 bucks or more, and we will list you on the Here in LA website forever. You'll also be given a number to denote how early you got in. Angelino number one, Allie Miller. Two, George Wright. Three, Rita Joanne. Four, Jason Sutter. Five, Grant Houghton. Six, Rob Baker. Seven, Kev Cheng. And eight, Brenda Garcia. Just PayPal your hard-earned cash to busblog at gmail.com. Want to support us? <laughs> but you got COVID toe, COVID toe and you beat the bears with it. You can still help. Post your favorite episode on the Facebook. Tweet something nice about this. Tell your friends. Tell all your friends. Tell your enemies. Tell them all. Tell them how Here in L.A. is spelled. And it's on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and Google. Here in L.A. is produced by myself, Tony Pierce, and the man who puts the J in Griffith J, Jordan Katz. Editing, mixing, and music supervision by Jordan Katz. Original songs by Oregon and Jordan Katz. Special thanks to Cindy for creating the logo, Jen for inspiring this, and Griffith J. Griffith for, despite being a scoundrel, gave us all a gift that even P-22 calls home. Send out your Christmas cards!